Hey, before this service begins, we just want to say thank you for making this service a part of your experience today. Whether you're watching it on a Sunday live or later on, we are praying that God would use something in this service, in this message to bless and minister to you. And we want to hear about that. If God is using something in this service, in this video to minister to you, would you do us a favor? Would you email me today online at cccomaha.org so we can celebrate how God is using this in your life? All right, well, Merry Christmas. It is the first Sunday of Advent. I decided to upgrade my clothing game uh, a little bit for the first Sunday of Advent, including raiding Minister Myron's closet for a great pair of shoes. Isn't that good? So uh, good to be with you here. Hey, the first Sunday of Advent, we have a tradition, or the first Sunday of December, is that we always give a financial update at the beginning of the message. And the reason behind that is we want to be transparent as a church as to all the things that are happening with our finances. If you're going to be outrageously generous, the best thing we could do is to be fully transparent about what's happening with the money, where it's going, all of those kinds of things. Wanted to let you know an update. Uh, going back to August, you might remember that we were at about 91% of our budget was uh, rolling in towards the end of the year. I have good news that uh, generosity has been fantastic. We're up to about 94.5% of our budget through uh, November 30th has come in, so we're very grateful uh, for that. That's uh, of the budget, what was budgeted for November 30th has come in. And uh, we're just grateful to see so many people uh, acting in ways that are generous and uh, prompting uh, God's spirit that way. Uh, so you may ask the question, okay, if we normally expect more money to come in in December, we're a little bit behind. We've actually trimmed our spending down to around 97 or 98%, so there's still a little bit of a gap that's there. What's the bottom line on what we need to be able to put it all together and end the year fully in the black? Uh, and the answer to that is $1.1 million worth of giving in December. So if that all comes in in December, we'll end the year in the black, refill all our buckets, and be positioned really well for ministry come January. Uh, if you're new, you may be wondering, how is that in terms of perspective? Well, it's not the lowest amount that we've ever needed in December. It's not the highest amount that we've ever needed in December. But anytime I say words like $1.1 million, in my heart I go, that's a lot of money. <laughs> It's a big amount of money, but we serve an even bigger God, amen? And uh, we trust that God will bring that in, and uh, I would ask you all to join me in praying. God has been faithful to this church 99 Decembers in a row, and uh, I trust that he's going to do that once again in this 100-year anniversary December, amen? So why don't we pray together, ask God to be providing for all of our needs, and then also be praying for uh, what he's going to be doing in the services this morning. Join me in prayer, please. Father, we're grateful uh, that you really have been the provider of Christ Community Church for 99 years. And Lord, we trust you to be the one who provides for us again. And so we come to you as your children, asking that you would provide for our church, for our city, for our world. Uh, that you would help us to be positioned well for the ministry that you've called us to in this next year and this next generation. And so we ask God that you would provide the resources for that. We pray, Lord, as well for this morning's message. We just invite your spirit to be speaking to our hearts and our minds and that you would be drawing us closer to you uh, with every moment. So this morning, God, we're eager to hear from you. So speak, Lord, and uh, we'll respond in faith. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're rolling through our Experiencing God series, and I hope that you guys have been tracking through in the books. One of the things that I've noticed is that the people who are tracking through on the Experiencing God books are experiencing powerful encounters with God. And you may think like I'm getting commissions on these guides or something by selling them. I am not getting any commissions on these. I just see the transformational work of God so powerfully that I want to encourage you to keep it up if you're already doing it. Or if you're not already doing it, it's okay just to start at week six and join in with us as uh, we're continuing on through week six. Or you can go back and start at week one, and it doesn't matter that much. You can continue through and just be a few weeks behind the rest of the church. All of that will work out just fine. And the paradigm that we're working on is a paradigm of how do you experience God by responding to him in faith. 
If you'll remember the main diagram that we used, it all starts with the idea that God is at work all around you. That's point number one. God is at work all around you. And our job is just to discover where God is at work and then join him in the things that he's already doing. That's the key that's behind it all. Now, we need to figure out how to recognize God's work because it definitely happens. And there's some science behind this idea. And the science is related to a part of your brain that's called the recticular activating center. That's a cool word, isn't it? Recticular activating center. And that's the part of your brain that helps you to recognize the kinds of things you're tuned into anyway, or the things you want to be tuned into. And you've all experienced this before. Like you've been in a place where there's a crowded room, there's buzzing noises going all over the room, and somebody says your name, and all of a sudden you tune in to that location. I mean, somebody else over there says omnibus, and you're like, I don't care about that at all. But when you hear your name, you tune in to that particular place. You guys experienced that before? Or what about when you're looking for a car? I don't know if you've ever been shopping for a new car and all of a sudden you look and you go, the Nissan Altima. Oh, that's a cool looking car. I've hardly seen that on the road at all. And then as soon as you recognize it, it's like Nissan Altimas are everywhere. You just see them all over the place. Well, your brain is tuned in. Your reticular activating center is tuned in to help you see the things that you're familiar with or we're looking for in a world of noise. And it works the same with God. That when you pray for God to show you where he's at work, when you think about where God is at work, when you tune into where God is at work, all of a sudden, it's like Nissan Altima's all over the place. You just see God at work here and here and here and here and you realize he was doing it all along. I'm just beginning to recognize that right now. So that's our first part. The second part of the diagram is that we are entering into a relationship with God. That God loves us so much. His primary characteristic is love. And then his expectation from us is that we respond in love and we have this love relationship with God. And it's in the context of the idea that God's at work and God loves us that he says, now I'm going to invite the ones I love to be at work with me. And he does that by speaking to us. And Pastor Alex did a great job last week of talking about how God speaks to us in powerful ways through his spirit, through his word, through prayer, through circumstances. And he invites us in by letting us know what he is doing, what he's all about in this world. And I love the way that uh, Alex positioned that and find that it's really, really true that God is always speaking. One of the clearest and most compelling ways he speaks is through his word. And it's not usually that God does the hunt and peck method, like you just drop open the Bible, put your finger on a verse, and boop, God's speaking to you in that verse. Sometimes he does that. But what I find is far more normal is that you spend days, hours, years, a lifetime of studying the Bible, and then whenever you're out interacting with the rest of the world, you've got this Bible buildup that's inside of you, and you bump into something in life, and all of a sudden, boom, Bible stuff pops out of you. You know how to respond to it because you've steeped yourself in the stories and the verses and the ideas and characteristics of God that come from the Bible. Well, over time, that becomes an upward cycle where you listen to God in the Bible, you respond in obedience because now you know how that Bible passage addresses your life, and you take it again to the next level, and then the Bible becomes more relevant and makes more sense, and you study it a little bit more, and it all just gets thicker and thicker, and it becomes easier to hear and obey God as time goes by. So as you're hearing God, you come to point number five on the diagram. And this is the relevant point for us to talk about today. Point number five is this. God's invitation to, you, to work with him, sorry, God's invitation to you to work with him always leads you to a crisis of belief. Everybody say crisis of belief. Crisis of belief. A crisis of belief that requires faith and action. And whoever you are, whatever your life is like, every believer in Jesus has certain points in their life that are a major crisis of belief, where you have to decide, how am I going to respond to God? 
And then throughout your life, you're going to have many episodes that are minor crises of belief where you just have to say, am I going to obey God in this little thing, in this next step? But it's good to know what that is like before you hit the situation so that you can be ready for it when that situation actually comes. So there's a second diagram uh, that's related to this. And uh, it's all about how God speaks, how God speaks to us. And uh, if we can throw up the second diagram, there we go. Uh, we have this crisis of belief that we had to, and then we have two options related to that. Number one is you can either adjust, change your life, and experience God. That's the preferred method. Or the other one is you just keep on sleepwalking through life. If you say yes to God, you'll adjust and change and experience God. If you say no then you'll be sleepwalking through life. Here's, here's where I come with a warning today. If you decide to say no when God is communicating with you, his voice becomes more distant. It becomes more dull and more difficult to hear from. But if you respond with a yes, it becomes louder. He reveals more to you. He positions you in the right place and he works more through you. Now, God can work through anyone. He's not dependent on you saying yes, for example. He can work with people who say no. Jonah is the prime example of this, right? God says, go this way. Jonah decides to go that way. And God says, we have ways of making you obey. And then he uses a great fish to drive him in the correct direction. I want to tell you that giving God your yes is a lot less painful. God can make you obey whether you say yes or no, but he tends to love to use people that are ready with their yes whenever he calls. It reminds me of the 1999 movie, my favorite movie of all time, The Matrix. Anybody else Matrix fans here? We got anybody who loves The Matrix? Yeah, five of us. I'm awesome. We're great in a group together. There's another movie coming out in a few weeks. I hope you guys know about that, Matrix Part 4. But anyway, in the first movie, uh, there was a scene where Neo, the main character, is presented by Morpheus with two options. You can take the red pill or you can take the blue pill. And the red pill was the dangerous pill. It was the pill that was going to lead him towards reality and a series of painful but very real and dramatic experiences, or the blue pill would leave him in the matrix where he's basically sleepwalking through a fantasy world that wasn't real, but it's really, really comfortable. And when God invites you into an adventure of faith, it's a red pill, blue pill moment. You can continue on with a sleepy, comfortable existence or you can choose the adventure with God. You can choose the red pill. And that's what God is inviting you into. And whenever you choose the red pill, it requires faith and action. Now, let's take a look for a moment at faith. Because faith is one of those hugely misunderstood aspects of the Christian life. Faith is not believing something that you know isn't true. That's a lot of what our culture thinks faith is, believing something that isn't true, believing something that you know isn't true. That's not faith. According to the Christian worldview, that's just stupid, okay? S-T-O-O-P-I-D, stupid. Instead, instead, faith requires evidence, and it's acting on the evidence of that faith, it's interesting, our secular culture oftentimes will affirm the idea of faith as being kind of a brand of silliness that helps you feel better. Have you ever noticed that it's socially acceptable in the media and other places to be able to say, my faith has carried me through this crisis, but it's socially unacceptable to say, Jesus has carried me through this crisis. Why? Because in the secular world, the thought is your faith is acceptable because that's your silly, nonsensical construct that makes you feel good when things are going bad. And so it's okay if that makes you feel better in hard situations. But when you start to intimate that there's a real person, a very direct reality that is helping you through that crisis, oh, all of a sudden now you're being offensive. So we have to understand what is faith in its reality? Well, faith has a great definition in Hebrews chapter 11, beginning at verse 1, which says this. 
Now, faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. Great definition, isn't it? Confidence in what we hope for and assurance in what we do not see. There's all kinds of things in this world that you act on that you don't have perfect information on. Things that you don't see, things that may be off in the future, but you act in faith that those kinds of things are going to happen. This gives us a great definition related to that. Interestingly, in the prayer meeting before the services, Dick Loneman gave me another uh, definition that also happens to be an acrostic of this. F-A-I-T-H is, uh, the definition is, fantastic adventures in trusting him. Isn't that good? Fantastic adventures in trusting him. That's what faith is. And by this definition that faith has its basis in evidence, you realize that you exercise faith every single day, don't you? Like when you go into a room and you turn on the light switch, you have confidence or hope that that switch is going to turn on the lights. Now, it's based on experience and evidence. You may not understand how electricity works and what makes that switch turn the lights on, but you know that it works that way, so you go ahead and take that step of faith. Or whenever you drive, you drive on the right side of the road, at least in the United States, because you have faith that everybody else is going to drive on the right side of the road and that that's going to make it a safe experience for you. You don't know it for sure, but based on the evidence of having driven a lot, you understand that's a very high likelihood and so you have confidence and act based on that confidence. When you go to Burger King, it's an act of faith. I mean, you're experiencing the faith that the guy in the back room is not trying to hock a loogie into your Whopper or drop some cyanide into your Dr. Pepper. You have faith that that's happening, and so you exercise that faith because why? Burger King has proven themselves to be faithful over and over and over again, and so you order the Whopper, those of you who have great faith do. So taken spiritually, we have evidence. All of these things are acts of faith that are based on evidence. So in our world, we have faith as well, faith in God, faith in our future that's based on evidence that God is real, based on the idea that he has spoken through people, that he's visited in Jesus, that he died and rose from the dead. And when he speaks, we see evidence of him in scripture and in community and in our personal internal experience with the Holy Spirit. All of these evidences pile up. We even see evidence in creation itself. And this is what the author of Hebrews points out in verse three. He says, By faith, we understand that the universe universe was formed at God's command so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. Okay, this is a very powerful verse, biblically, philosophically, and scientifically. By faith, we realize that it was God who is the one who formed the universe at his command. Now, for people who are Christians and Jews who go back to the book of Genesis, we would say the first five words of Genesis are what indicate that to us. In the beginning, God created. And we know that from that, the universe has a beginning, and we know who's the one who created it. God created it from the beginning point on. Now, you may not know this, but this is an unusual worldview in all of the worldviews that there are. If you look at world religions or different forms of animism, most of them either teach that the universe went on and on forever and it never had a beginning, or that we're in some cycle that just continues on and on and on. Christianity and the Jewish worldview were unique in that they said there is an in-the-beginning moment. And cosmologists will affirm this. They'll go back and they'll say, we can look back 13.8 billion years and see that there was a moment in time that the universe began. They call it the Big Bang. But what cosmologists can't explain is what made the Big Bang bang, right? What started it all? Where did the material come from? Where, Where was the stuff that created the universe? They can't answer why is there something rather than nothing. They can't answer, where did all the laws of physics that fine-tune this universe to perfection come from? They can't answer the question, why did life come from non-life? Why did intelligence come from non-intelligence? Why did love come from non-love? 
And if there's no intelligent creator that's behind it, they're asking you to take a blind leap of faith into the darkness that has no evidence behind it. It simply doesn't make sense. But the idea that there was intelligence behind intelligence and divine life behind human life and that there was divine love behind the love that we experience, oh, all of a sudden, that makes sense. That the universe was formed at God's command so that what is seen was not made out of what is visible. Well, that's how it works in the scientific community, but how does faith work in human behavior? In human behavior. Hebrews 11 gives us example after example of people that responded to God in faith based on the evidence that they did have or based on the communication of God that they did have. It's actually a long list of people that's called the Hall of Faith. And what they all have in common is that they all were around before Jesus and yet are good in Jesus because they responded in faith to the revelation that they did have. One of the classic examples is in chapter uh, 11, verse 8, where Abraham is talked about. Abraham is the father of the Jewish family, and it says this, By faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. Now, that's a powerful idea there. Because here's Abraham in Ur of the Chaldeans. You know, he's off in ancient Iraq. And God says to him, go the place that I tell you to go. But he has no idea where that place is or where he's going. I love what Alex said last week when he was talking about how God is not like Siri who gives us a def- destination or we give him the destination and he just gives us turn by turn instructions of how to get there. Instead, God directs us a lot like he directed Abraham. He says, go to the next place, and you just go without knowing what the master plan is. So Abraham pulls up his tent pegs, he gathers together his flocks, he gets his family in place, and they just start traveling north along the Euphrates River, up the Fertile Crescent towards a place called Haran, where they stop for a while, and then God shows him, it's time for you to go down south into the place we now call Israel, and eventually landing in a city called Beersheba. Abraham followed God based on the revelation that he did have, even though he did not know the end of the story. Friends, this is what real faith is all about. We say yes to God now without knowing exactly where he's taking us or what the end of the story is. We trust that God's promises are going to be good. Now, Abraham is just one example Hebrews 11 has a whole list of people, Moses, Elijah, Rahab, a female Gentile prostitute, who all exercised faith and were commended for for their faith based on what they knew, and they pleased God because they acted in faith based on what they did know. And then the passage continues on. And it says, there's a whole bunch of other people that I didn't talk about. And it gives kind of the big lump of a whole bunch of people at the end. Here's what it says when it gives the whole lot of other people part. This is starting in verse 32. And what more shall I say? I don't have the time to tell you about Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, about David and Samuel and the prophets and those who faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, and gained what was promised who shut the mouths of lions, who quenched the fury of the the flames, and who escaped the edge of the sword, whose weakness was turned into strength, and who became powerful in battle and routed foreign armies. Women received back their dead, raised to life again. There were others who were tortured, refusing to be released so that they might gain an even better resurrection. Some faced jeers and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were put to death by stoning. They were sawed in two. They were killed by the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, persecuted, and mistreated. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and mountains, living in caves and in holes in the ground. 
Interestingly, all of the people on this super list, the everybody else list, acted in faith. But did you notice that some got rewards like being saved from lions or administering justice or conquering kingdoms? And others acted equally in faith but had horrible things happen to them, like being sought in two or imprisoned. Did you notice that faith does not always lead to pleasant circumstances? Sometimes faith leads to death or imprisonment. And if we go through our life with the expectation that, hey, if I only live by faith, my experiences will be pleasant, I think you're in for a rude awakening at some point when the experiences that you have are just not that pleasant. Because life is oftentimes disappointing. And the next two verses help us to understand this well. It says, these were all commended for their faith, yet none of them received what had been promised, since God had planned something better for us so that only together with us would they be made perfect. It makes you ask the question, what's the promises that they had that they were acting in faith on? Like if it wasn't pleasant circumstances for the rest of their lives, what was the future promises that they were banking on? Well, one was that a Messiah was coming and that he was going to reign in this world and start a new kingdom filled with love and justice and peace and power. and It was going to be really good. And the second thing is that not only would he come once, but there would come a day when this entire world would be transformed and all of the sin and evil and death and suffering would be eliminated in this world. And oh, by the way, when that revolution happens, we will be made perfect as well. We'll no longer be bound by sin and death and suffering and mourning and crying and cancer and pain. We'll be freed from all of those things and God is going to make us perfect as he makes the world perfect. And this is good news, amen? Amen. Now, they looked forward to those three things happening. And here's the deal. We have an advantage over them because we've already seen one of them be fulfilled in Jesus. That's why we're celebrating at Christmas time. Because God didn't leave us alone, he didn't leave us silent, but he intervened in this world in order to be able to start a kingdom of love and justice. And he proved who he was by making outrageous claims and then proving that he was right in all of those claims by doing miracles and healing people and raising people from the dead and walking on water and then dying and rising from the dead himself. And since then, that kingdom has been the most transformational force in the history of planet Earth. And we can look backwards on that and say, okay, we're still looking forward to the promises that have not yet been fulfilled, but we can have more confidence than the people back there because we know that this has happened already. And so we live on faith towards the future based on the evidence that we have already seen from the past. It's our confidence in this that gives us hope for the future. It's what enables us to live on the faith Adventure or the fantastic adventure in trusting Him. Only God is big enough to know every person's circumstances and thoughts. And so He invites us on an individual basis into this experience with Him that helps us connect the dots from the past of Jesus to the future that God has for us. And this is why we're on this experience in God adventure so that we can hear from God and respond to him on whatever the next thing is he's calling us to, custom designed for each and every one of you. Now, you guys know that I'm not just a a leader of this church. I'm not just a minister here at the church and someone who's leading the Experience in God experience. I'm a participant as well. And I'm having my own experiences of God. And to be honest, I have expectations of what God would do in my life during this series as well. I've been at this for 25 years or so, so I kind of have patterns I expect God to continue in on. For example, I had the expectation that in the past five weeks and the next four weeks, I would hear from God for a new vision for Christ Community Church. Those of you who have been around for a while know that about five years ago, I talked to you about a vision called the Beyond Belief Vision, and we've been living that out for the last five years, and I told you it was going to last about five years, and then we'd have a new vision that God would bring to us. 
So my expectation is that during experiencing God, he would give me a new vision for Christ Community Church. So during my prayer times, oftentimes I'm sitting there with God going, speak God for your servant is listening. All right, God. And I got to tell you, as I've been listening, I've been getting nothing. I'm like, what is up with that? This is what I was expecting was going to be happening. But I haven't been hearing anything related to Christ Community Church on this. I've had some inspirational moments, but no clarity from God. But here's something that God has spoken on, and it's a little bit vulnerable for me to say. It totally surprised me, so... I hope I can go there this morning, even though it's, it's a little bit risky for me. One principle that stood out to me during this study is that God wants a love relationship more than he wants performance. Any other performance addicts out there who are like, ah, that's convicting. I pride myself on performance and efficiency, so that's probably part of the reason why I was seeking God for a church vision. It's part of my performance junkiness. But this line, I just had to take to heart. It says this, God cares more about who you are becoming than what you do. Now, the next principle was the idea that sometimes... God is silent because he wants you to seek his person more than he wants you to seek his purposes. So maybe God doesn't give me church vision because he wants me to seek him more. Not results, just relationship. So one morning, I'm reading this section about how God is a loving father. Now for the context here, Two weeks ago, a friend of ours from church gave our family the awesome gift of a week in their family cottage in Wyoming. So we spontaneously changed our Thanksgiving plans from a four-day experience to a seven-day experience, and that created some space for us to just have some long, wandering times with God. In front of a picture window overlooking the Grand Tetons, it was a powerful experience. And before the kids got up, it was great to just wake up early and experience God with no real expectations. So one morning I'm reading that section about how God is a loving father. And I thought, I know that feeling. I mean, I'm a loving father. And just the night before, I was having loving father conversations with my kids. And so in my prayer time, God led me to ask this question. If you had a real loving father, what kind of conversations would he be having with you right now? And since your heavenly father is your loving father, what might he be speaking to you right now? So I just kind of let go of my agenda and I had this overwhelming feeling of God caring for me and I just listened to what he had to say. And what surprised me is that he did not want to talk about the church. He wanted to talk to me about me, in particular about my health. And I'll tell you, it was not an audible voice, but it was a deep sense of his presence with a leading in a particular direction and some overwhelming emotion. It was like God was saying, Mark, you've made a good-hearted sacrifice to lead your church and your family for the last 25 years, but in the process, you've neglected your own body, another gift that I have given you. And it's about time for you to pay attention to that because you may have another 40 years on this planet. And I thought about all the stuff that I've been putting off, and I won't bore you with the details of it, but it's stuff I've been putting off for three years, five years, some stuff for 20 years. God revealed to me that about the best gift that I could give to my wife and to my family and to my church is to take care of myself so that I could continue doing ministry for another 40 years. So I start, now don't be worried. I don't think I'm gonna be lead pastor here for 40 more years. A 93-year-old pastor has probably gone past his prime. 
But I did start taking steps in that this week, and while most of you will never notice, I hope you all benefit, and just so you know how I'm experiencing God this month. Now, I tell you this mostly because I want to challenge you to seek out a similar kind of experience, to ask you a question. If God is a loving Father, and He knows everything about your life, everything about your relationships, everything about your internal world, what would your loving Father say to you at this time of your life? What would He want to speak into you? I mean, maybe it's about your health, but probably not. Maybe it's that He wants you to have a relationship with Him. And He's saying, I love you so much. I just want you to crawl up into my lap and be my daughter, be my son. You've been running from me for a long time and now it's time for you to come back and say yes to me. Maybe he wants to talk to you about your finances. Maybe you've been struggling with long-term debt and he wants you to head to something like Financial Peace University where you can get all of the tools to be headed out of debt in the next year. Or maybe, just Maybe he's saying, you've been holding on too, long, too much to your finances. You've been stockpiling too much. And it's time for you to release your grip on the material things of this world and be more generous towards me and towards my purposes on this planet. Or maybe your loving father would say to you, you know, I just want to hang out with you more. I want to join you at school, at your workplace, in your athletics. I'd love to have some good, extended, quiet times, just you and me. I'd, I'd love to be alone with you more. Would you give me more access to your life? Or maybe your loving father is saying, you know that destructive habit that you've been giving yourself to? How about giving that habit to me and I'll give you freedom in return? Or maybe your loving father is saying to you, You know, Christmas is coming up, and you're going to be seeing your family. How about reconciling that family relationship before it becomes awkward at Christmas? How about making the phone call to the person that you need to catch up with? How about apologizing for that thing that you did wrong? Maybe your father would have you do that. Or maybe your loving father is saying, How about bringing me along with to your family celebration this year and not hiding me? How about introducing me to your family and a relationship with me? You know, I don't know what kind of an experience God would custom design for you, but I know that he's good, and I know that he just might have something powerful for you. Maybe what you expect, or maybe nothing like what you would expect. But here's the bottom line. Whether it's a big change like moving or adoption or changing jobs or a little change like spending more time with Jesus or doing something about your health, they each take faith. And real faith is not just believing the right things. Real faith involves acting on the right things that will change the trajectory of your life, the places you live, the people that you love, and the grace that you give on a day-to-day basis. So let's act in faith together with an anticipation of God being at work in our lives. Amen? Let's stand together and pray. Father, I'm so grateful for your grace that you've given to the people who are here in this room, for the way that you have been speaking to them, for the way that you love them right for where they're at, for the ways that you're showing them more of your presence and your purposes. God, we're grateful for your love that's at work, even in each of their lives individually, and for the way you custom design your message for us to be able to hear from you. And so, Lord, we pray for your speaking to be clear, We pray that you would give all of us the courage to act on faith based on what you reveal to us. And we pray that you'll show us more of your presence, your purposes, and your power. Help us, Lord, to act in faith towards you. And we pray this all in the name of Jesus, our Savior, our Sanctifier, 
our healer and our king who is coming. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. God bless you guys. Hey, it's Alex here again. If you made it this far in the video, thank you for engaging with us online. And that means hopefully that you have heard or experienced God in some way through the message or through the service today. And I would really love it if you would take time to share that with us because that helps us celebrate how God is using our online ministry to reach people in whatever capacity that they're engaging in. And so would you do me a favor? Would you just take a moment, if God is ministering to you through this, to let me know how, you can email online at cccomaha.org or you can even drop a comment wherever you're watching. Or if you're on YouTube right now, you can click that subscribe button and, and click the bell to get notifications for whenever we drop new content online. But seriously, we are praying about this ministry. We're, we're hoping that God is using this and we want to help you take your best next step wherever that is and wherever in the world you are. We hope to see you soon.